You are welcome to this brief introduction to the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 6 through chapter 7, verse 3, with special attention to verses 4 through 6. The Epistle to the Hebrews was composed in the third quarter of the first century CE in Koine Greek. The text has been well preserved across 19 centuries. Nevertheless, some minor alterations were made by copyists. For example, in chapter 6, verse 3, some ancient manuscripts read, Let us do, instead of we shall do. And in chapter 7, verse 1, other ancient manuscripts read, Abraham who was returning, instead of Abraham returning. Of course, the meaning remains the same. You can download other sample variants from the website hebrews.cura.download. In fact, all the documents cited in this brief introduction are available at the same website. This chapter translates several Greek terms that are worthy of your consideration. For example, the term impossible in chapter 6, verse 4. When Jesus' disciples asked him, Who can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God, employing the same Greek term adunatos. This word is sometimes taken in an absolute sense, such as, It is impossible for God to lie. And in 10.4, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And in 11.6, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The term enlightened occurs in Ephesians 1.8, where we read, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which God has called you. And in Hebrews 10.3, recall the former days when you were enlightened. Enlightenment seems to refer to Christian conversion. In chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, we have two occurrences of the verb to taste, which is defined as to experience something cognitively or emotionally, or come to know something. Jesus said of some of his followers that they would not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming. And in John chapter 8, Jesus promised, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. But in Hebrews 2, 9, By the grace of God... He, Jesus, might taste death for everyone. Thus, taste is to experience the reality. And in chapter 6, verse 6, the verb to renew or to restore. This was used in the epistle of Barnabas to mean the forgiveness of sins. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our inner spiritual person is being renewed. In Romans 12, 2, we are exhorted to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God and thereby to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. In Titus 3, 5, it is definitely the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Thus, renewal is a work of God. The grammar of chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, requires special attention for the interpretation of that difficult passage. We want to note that in these verses, all the verbs consist of one infinitive with seven participles. Greek infinitives and participles, unlike other languages, have tense. The present tense normally indicates constant state or condition or ongoing action or repetitive action, whereas the aorist tense indicates a state or an action saying nothing about its time or its duration or its repetition. 
Now, the one infinitive in this text is the verb to renew or restore. It has the present tense, meaning to renew repetitively. The other verbs are participles in verses 4, 5, and 6. These have the aorist tense, referring to experiences preceding renew to repentance. Therefore, these can all be translated having been enlightened, having tasted, and having fallen away. The last two participles, crucifying and shaming, have the present tense describing an ongoing circumstance, so can be translated as because or as a result or with while doing or as long as they keep on doing. So we're left with this query. Does this passage teach that renewed repentance remains impossible because the fallen are treating Jesus' death with disrespect? Or does it mean that renewed repentance remains impossible as long as the fallen continue in their disbelief towards Jesus' sacrifice? In either case, logically speaking, if the circumstance were removed, then renewed repentance would become possible. Is this why Jesus taught that which is impossible with humans is possible with God? Let us now look at our passage and its outline in the, in the entire epistle. According to the discourse analysis of Dr. Westfall, in the first section of the epistle, we were exhorted to consider Jesus as the apostle of our confession, that is, the one whom we confess. We are now in the second great section, which exhorts us to consider Jesus as the high priest of our confession. In the last lesson, we dealt with point A, let us press on to maturity with new teaching about Jesus' priesthood. And in the current section B, we encounter how the new teaching results in access to God. It is helpful to look carefully at the argument or the logic of our passage. Earlier in the epistle, we encountered four great inferences. In chapter 2, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. In chapter 3, Therefore, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. In chapter 4, Therefore, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed. And in the same chapter, verse 14, Therefore, let us hold fast to our confession. In chapter 6, we arrive at a major inference, Wherefore, let us go on to maturity. Spiritual maturity is the goal of this chapter. In chapter 5, we had met a major thesis stating Jesus has become the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And from that great statement, our chapter draws an inference when it says in verse 1, Therefore, let us go on to maturity not repenting again. Verse 4 leads us to an explanation for this inference, where we read, For it is impossible to keep on repenting, with an illustration. For God blesses good deeds, and he burns up worthless deeds, and then makes an application. And salvation brings better things. The reason for that? For God rewards good works. And likewise, we want you to persevere. And there's a purpose to this, that you imitate those who inherit the promises. Our inference, let us go on to maturity, not repenting again, has a second explanation. For God's oath and Jesus' eternal priesthood encourage hope. 
and this explanation of that hope, for Melchizedek, who blessed Abraham, resembles the Son of God. Again, download this outline from the website. If you teach or preach this text to others, it could be very helpful to them if you had others read the text aloud in a group setting and then pose queries such as the following. What does this chapter want Christians to do? Well, we hope that some will discover that they are to go on to maturity. What is repentance from dead works? If they've been following the text carefully, they will discover that dead works are religious ceremonies and sacrifices that do not give life. After reading verses 4 through 6, perhaps you might ask, what do real Christian believers experience? And they'll talk about their conversion, receiving the Holy Spirit, answers to prayer, personal transformation through the Holy Spirit. Some of your listeners are already asking themselves, if I fall away or commit a bad sin, can I repent and start all over? The reply is, no, it is impossible to be renewed unto repentance. And then you explain what God wants. In verses 7 through 8, ask the believers to think about this. What does God think of mature Christians' good works? And what does God think of immature Christians' bad works? Going on to verses 9 through 12, have someone read the text and then asks, what does God expect real Christians to do? And what does he expect them to show? After reading verses 13 through 20, pose this query. In what two ways does God give us strong hope? And in what way does Jesus give us strong hope? As you move into chapter 7, the first three verses, you will want to ask, who was the historical Melchizedek? You should be ready to explain that he was a Canaanite king and a priest of the Most High God, the same God who had called Abraham to leave his family for a promised land. And then, in what ways does Melchizedek resemble Jesus, the Son of God? As you teach or preach through the passage, you will encounter several historic Christian doctrines that are already present in this epistle. In verse 1, the doctrine of repentance and faith. And in verse 2, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. In verse 4, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. In verses 4 and 5, a description of spiritual conversion. In verse 5, reference to the age to come. In verse 12, the promises of God. And in verse 20, Jesus, our high priest in heaven. Thus, we have some assignments for you. Your homework this week is to read through Hebrews 6, 1 through 7, 3 once a day in different translations. As you do so, jot down notes and queries that you want to discuss in your Bible study group. In particular, be ready to discuss these seven queries. Who are those that fall away? What had they experienced? What does it mean to fall away? What does impossible mean? What are the reasons for this impossibility? And what are the consequences? And is there any way out of this dire situation? What is that way? May God bless you richly as you seek insight from His Holy Spirit while carefully reading through this passage.